Good day. Welcome to the Pure Storage First Quarter Fiscal 2025 Financial Results Conference Call. Today's conference is being recorded. All lines will be muted during the presentation portion of the call, with an opportunity for questions and answers at the end. If you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. At this time, I'd like to turn the call over to Paul Zayetz, Vice President of Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Pure's first quarter fiscal year 2025 earnings conference call. On the call, we have Charlie Giancarlo, Chief Executive Officer, Kevin Chrysler, Chief Financial Officer, and Rob Lee, Chief Technology Officer. Following Charlie's and Kevin's prepared remarks, we will take questions. Our press release was issued after closed market and is posted on our website where this call is being simultaneously webcast. The slides that accompany this webcast can be downloaded at investor.purestorage.com. On this call today, we will make forward-looking statements which are subject to various risks and uncertainties. These include statements regarding our financial outlook and operations, our strategy, technology, and its advantages, trends. Any forward-looking see them. Our actual results may differ materially from the results forecasted, and reported results should not be considered as an indication of future performance. A discussion of some of the risks and uncertainties relating to our business is contained in our filings with the SEC, and we refer you to those public filings. During this call, all financial metrics and associated growth rates are non-GAAP measures other than revenue, remaining performance obligations, or RPL, and cash and investments. Reconciliations to the most directly comparable GAAP measures are provided in our earnings press release and slides. This call is being broadcast live on the Pure Storage Investor Relations website and is being recorded for playback purposes. An archive of the webcast will be available on the IR website and is the property of Pure Storage. Our second quarter, fiscal 2025, quiet period begins at the close of business Friday, July 19, 2024. With that, I'll turn it over to Charlie. Thank you, Paul. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Q1 fiscal 2025 earnings call. Thank you for joining us today. We are pleased with our Q1 performance, returning to double-digit revenue growth for the quarter. Our highly differentiated platform strategy continues to demonstrate success and rings true with customers. The recent advances in AI have opened up multiple opportunities for Pure in several market segments. Of greatest interest to the media and financial analysts has been the high-performance data storage market for large public or private GPU farms. A second opportunity is providing specialized storage for enterprise inference engine or RAG environments. The third opportunity, which we believe to be the largest in the long term, is upgrading all enterprise storage to perform as a storage cloud, simplifying data access and management and eliminating data silos, enabling easier data access for AI. Pure is seeing early success in all three of these AI-based opportunities, and we can address them all with our unified Purity platform. Unlike other vendors, we do not require different operating system software to address different storage needs. AI inevitably calls customers' attention to the fragmented state of their data caused by their disparate data storage infrastructure. Data stored on widely diverse platforms with different operating and management systems, which are siloed and individually managed, are unable to feed real-time data to AI inference engines. The Pure Storage Platform Strategy provides a unified and integrated data storage and delivery system across customers' various data environments. It facilitates seamless management and data access across data centers and the cloud with simplified universal policies and management. We will be announcing significant new advances to this platform strategy next month at our Accelerate Customer and Partner Conference. Our platform vision played a crucial role in securing several strategic enterprise deals this quarter. The ease of use of our platform and a notable interest in saving power and reduced environmental impact led to a notable win with a managed service provider specializing in high-performance computing. 
Their accelerated environment for both large language models and inferencing delivers top-tier AI infrastructure and training solutions for their financial services, energy, and life sciences customers. Enterprise and international market segments were strong this last quarter. Our e-family continues its strong growth and was also a key enabler in our discussions with hyperscalers. Flashblade had a record Q1, including in AI workloads. We are seeing broader adoption across geographies, including both prospects and existing customers. Flashblade's ability to span the price performance spectrum from the highest sustained performance required for AI to low cost applications such as backup is incredibly compelling. We continue to make significant progress in penetrating every area of online data storage with our purity and direct flash technology, both in the enterprise and in the cloud. The quantity and quality of our discussions with hyperscalers have advanced considerably this past quarter. Hyperscalers have a broad range of storage environments. These include high performance storage based on SSDs, multiple levels of lower cost HDD based nearline storage, and tape based offline storage. We are in a unique position to provide our purity and direct flash technology for both their high performance and their nearline environments which make up the majority of their storage purchases. Our most advanced engagements now include both testing and commercial discussions. As such, we continue to believe we will see a design win this year. Pure storage technology brings multiple advantages to hyperscaler infrastructure. Data storage is either first or second in power and space consumption in data centers. First, Purity and direct flash reduces the power, space, and cooling requirements for hyperscale data storage by a factor of 10 or more. Second, Pure reduces the need for sophisticated caching and other technologies that hyperscalers use to make up for the relatively low performance of hard drives. Third, Pure's technology improves server performance by accelerating data delivery. And finally, Pure's technology significantly improves both the reliability and the longevity of their storage, thereby significantly reducing costs. Increased energy use is a major issue in costs for both hyperscalers and enterprise data centers. This is even more important as introducing AI in data centers promises to consume ever greater amounts of power and cooling. Pure storage can dramatically reduce the power usage in existing data centers by upwards of 20%, bringing significant power and cooling for AI workloads. Another reason why hyperscalers are interested in pure technology. In the enterprise, we are seeing continued momentum and opening new opportunities with our cloud operating model. Enterprises want their data centers to operate the same way as cloud companies operate theirs. Customers should be able to automate and manage storage as virtualized clouds of storage, whether located on-prem or in the cloud. Delivering a complete cloud operating model, Evergreen One allows our customers to consume storage as a service based entirely on guaranteed service level agreements, enabling them to store their data whenever and wherever they want with guaranteed reliability and performance. It provides customers with hands-free storage services where and when they need it, managed entirely through our Pure One management portal. Additionally, hybrid cloud has now become the standard design practice by enterprises. They now expect the same cloud experience of self-service, flexibility, and agility from their private data center infrastructure. It's no longer only about price performance and features. Pure Fusion solves the complexity of traditional IT and storage by joining storage arrays into virtual storage pools. Managers can manage their entire fleet of arrays by policy and are able to set up custom storage services for both IT and developers. Pure Fusion combines enterprise storage with a cloud operating model, cloud agility and scalability, and enables easier access to real-time data stores for applications such as AI. 
Hear more about Pure Fusion at next month's Pure Accelerate event. Moving on to the market as a whole, we have not seen a significant change in the overall macro environment or customers' intentions to buy. While we have great enthusiasm for our opportunities in AI, spending on AI may put pressure on other parts of IT budgets. We believe that the storage market will fare relatively well in this IT economy, but have yet to see a major inflection. Overall, we believe that we are well positioned in all of the segments we compete in, and we will continue to gain share across our markets. Our leadership position is now clearly demonstrated by our competitors increase fervor to mimic our strategy and our messages. We also believe that long-term secular trends for data storage are no longer based on the expectation of commoditized storage, but rather on high technology data storage systems and run very much in our favor. We will discuss these long-term trends in more detail at our upcoming financial analyst session at Accelerate. With that, I'll turn it over to Kevin. Thank you, Charlie. We saw a strong start to our year in Q1 as our financial performance outperformed across both revenue and profitability. Revenue grew a healthy 18% and operating profit of $100 million resulted in a new high record for a Q1. Specifically, we were very pleased that we returned to strong double-digit revenue growth in Q1. Two key drivers of our revenue growth this quarter were one, sales to new and existing enterprise customers across our entire data storage platform, and two, strong customer demand for our FlashBlade solutions, including FlashBlade E. In Q1, Subscription Services Annual Recurring Revenue, or ARR, was healthy, growing 25% to over $1.4 billion. As we mentioned previously, Subscription Services ARR excludes non-cancelable evergreen subscription contracts where the effective service date has not started. Including non-cancelable subscription contracts where the effective service date has not started, subscription services ARR at the end of Q1 grew 26%. Total RPO, which includes both subscription services and product orders, grew 27% year over year in Q1, to $2.3 billion. As a reminder, product orders within RPO include a non-cancelable telco order in Q3 FY24 and orders relating to a Fortune 500 financial services company in Q4 FY24. RPO associated solely with our subscription service offerings at the end of Q1 grew 24%. Q1 year-over-year -year subscription RPO growth was affected by several large Evergreen One opportunities that closed during Q1 of last year. Although we expect larger Evergreen One opportunities to close as we progress through the year, no large opportunities closed during Q1. Total contract value, or TCV sales for our storage as a service offerings during Q1 were $56 million. We saw building demand and pipeline including large opportunities for our storage as a service offerings during Q1. Consistent with our original FY25 forecast, we expect 50% growth of our storage as a service offerings, including Evergreen One and Evergreen Flex, achieving 600 million in TCV sales. US revenue for Q1 was $489 million, and international revenue was $204 million. Our new customer acquisition grew by 262 customers during Q1, and we now serve 61% of the Fortune 500. Product and subscription services gross margins both contributed to strong total gross margin strength of 73.9% in Q1. Product gross margin was 72.8%, and subscription services gross margin was 74.9%. While reflecting strong gross margins, we are aggressively competing and winning customers' secondary and lower storage tiers with our eFamily solutions and FlasherA C. Operating profit and margin strength of 14 and one half percent were positively impacted by revenue overachievement, strong gross margin performance, 
in disciplined investing. Our headcount decreased slightly to approximately 5,500 employees at the end of the quarter. Pure's balance sheet and liquidity remains very strong, including $1.7 billion in cash and investments at the end of Q1. Cash flow from operations during the quarter was $222 million, and capital expenditures were $49 million, representing approximately 7% of revenue. Factors contributing to capital expenditures included test equipment, supporting our engineering teams for new innovations, continued build-out of our new headquarters, and infrastructure, supporting our Evergreen One storage-as-a-service sales. Our objective of partially offsetting dilution using share repurchases remains, though during Q1, we did not repurchase shares of stock because of trading restrictions. Beginning in June, we will also fund withholding taxes due on employee equity awards by net share withholding, which will also reduce share dilution. We have approximately $395 million on our existing repurchase authorizations. Now turning to our guidance. For Q2, we expect revenue of $755 million and expect that operating profit will be $125 million or operating margin of 16.6%. Turning to our annual guidance for FY25, we are reiterating our FY25 revenue and operating margin guidance. We are pleased with the strong start to the year with both top line and operating profit outperforming. Also, while storage spending for AI is still in its early stages, we believe that we are well positioned as demand for data storage accelerates. At the same time, we are also remaining mindful of the macro spending environment. In closing, we are pleased with the strong start to the year. This is an unprecedented time for Pure as we are well positioned to participate in substantial and sustained growth opportunities, whether driven by AI or our pursuit of replacing the vast majority of data storage with pure flash for all customer workloads, including hyperscalers bulk storage. We look forward to seeing many of you at our product and technology focused financial analyst meeting at Accelerate in Las Vegas on June 20th. With that, I will turn it back to Paul for Q&A. Thanks, Kevin. Before we begin the Q&A session, I'll ask you to please limit yourselves to one question consisting of one part so we can get to as many people as possible. If you have additional questions, we kindly ask that you please rejoin the queue and we'll be happy to take those additional questions as time allows. Operator, let's get started. Thank you. If you would like to ask a question, please press star followed by one on your telephone keypad. If for any reason you would like to remove that question, please press star followed by one. Again, to ask a question, press star one. As a reminder, if you're using a speakerphone, please remember to pick up your handset before asking your question. We'll pause here briefly as questions are registered. Our first question comes from Amit Daryanani from Evercore. Please go ahead, your line is open. Um, thank you. Um, good afternoon, guys. I guess Charles, I'm hoping you could just talk a bit more about the cloud opportunity for Pure going forward. Um, you know, I think Meta had a white paper out recently that they talked about using some other provider for this storage need. And then talked about a new cloud when at some point this year. Uh, but, you know, how large do you think the cloud opportunity can be for Pure on active level of the specific win? Um, do you think the opportunity is bigger in AI versus non AI? Just anything more on the cloud side would be helpful. Sure, thank you, Amit. Um, so we are, have a discipline in terms of how we refer to these, uh, what I'll call three different segments, uh, AI, uh, cloud, and hyperscaler. And when we speak about each one of them, uh, I wanna be clear to everyone, we're, we try to be quite disciplined. So when we have an AI win, whether that's in an enterprise or a GPU cloud, or even a, in a hyperscaler, you know, we'll call that AI. Uh, when we, uh, we, we've been speaking about uh, getting a design win in a hyperscaler, that speaks specifically to their standard uh, storage that they use both for their own compute and for their customers' uh, storage that go onto you know, the hyperscaler uh, storage uh, cloud environments. And when we speak about cloud, we speak about um, our uh, capabilities to operate like a cloud in the enterprise, but also 
are software that operates on top of the hyperscaler, such as Cloud Block Store or uh, Portworks, that allow our customers to achieve, if you will, a multi-cloud of data. So when we, uh, you mentioned Meta, and yes, we've sold into their uh, into uh, their GPU environment. By the way, they have multiple AI environments, and we are in the majority of the environments that we're aware of uh, in uh, in Meta AI. Um, but when we speak about that, we'll speak about that as it, uh, as AI wins. That'll contribute to our AI wins. Uh, when we speak about getting a design win in a hyperscaler, we're talking about their standard uh, storage. And when we speak about cloud, that really uh, does speak to Cloud Block Store as well as Portworks, uh, as well as you know when we operate our arrays as a platform across the multiple data centers of the customer. Uh, and even into the cloud block store on the hyperscaler, we referred that to that as our cloud wins. So going back to your question, and sorry to elongate it, but I wanted to make sure that everyone is aware of the way we use those those words. I believe that we think that um, you know AI presents an immediate opportunity in machine learning, but that it will uh, also drive customers uh, to. Um, focus on upgrading their entire data storage. And we believe that represents an opportunity for us uh, with our platform play uh, to not only upgrade their capabilities, but allow their storage to operate as a cloud of storage rather than as individual arrays. Um, and we believe that, um, you know, we believe that's a very big opportunity in the somewhat longer term. Uh, we also believe that our opportunity to sell into the hyperscalers for their traditional storage environment uh, for, you know, their customer environment, their own storage environment uh, represents a very big opportunity, uh, one that we're very excited about. Yeah, I mean, and this is Rob, just to jump onto that, uh, to help you think about size, scale, and uh, just some context behind it, as we think about the hyperscaler environments in particular, yeah, there's been a lot of focus and attention paid uh, to the AI deployments and build outs, uh, but the larger general purpose uh, bulk storage uh, environments that Charlie's speaking of, uh, we believe consist on even today uh, 80 to 90 percent, um, you know, of, of uh, their total storage buildouts are sitting on disk, are being uh, deployed on disk, are uh, going to serve these general purpose environments, and, and that's uh, really the opportunity that we see, um, you know, as we refer to the uh, hyperscalers. And you know, to some extent, uh, you know, as, as Charlie said, the AI opportunity, uh, you know, is, is one that we do well in as well. I think the other thing that's going on in these hyperscaler environments is because uh, there's so much focus being placed on AI buildout, uh, that's presenting a real uh, challenge when it comes to power uh, and space. Uh, and so that's really uh, in our ad advancing discussions with these hyperscaler firms, uh, it's becoming clear that uh, power availability, uh, securing, uh, you know, just the operational uh, limitations uh, to be able to go and, and uh, maintain the storage footprint they have uh, today uh, on disk uh, is becoming a real challenge for them and, and one that, uh, you know, we're very hopeful to go and uh, help them with. Thank you, Amit. Next question, please. Our next question comes from Mita Marshall from Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Uh, great. Thanks so much. Um, I just wanted to get any commentary you could provide on just uh, as NAND prices increase, just on how you guys are thinking about gross margins. Clearly, uh, no impact this quarter, but just any expected impact over uh, the calendar year. Thanks. Thanks, Mita. You, you know, as you uh, recall, we operate in a, in a dynamic pricing, a storage in general is in, in a dynamic pricing environment. Uh, that is to say that customers buy storage uh, episodically. When they do, they want to negotiate. Uh, we, we negotiate uh, in a competitive environment against uh, competitive players who tend to uh, price on a cost plus environment. And as such, uh, you know, ASPs, if you will, uh, for on a per gigabyte basis tend to fluctuate with the underlying commodity. So net net of all that is uh, is NAND prices generally don't affect our gross margin as much as they do with the market, uh, the top line of the market as a whole. Uh, and so with prices rising, I think that's you know somewhat of a tail that should be something of a of a tailwind in general. Although you know customers generally have a set budget, so uh, you, you know put that all in a blender, it, it shouldn't affect our uh, or, or the industry's gross margins all that significantly. Yeah, in, in a meaningful way. Uh, and just following on to, to Charlie's point, um, look, we're really pleased with our gross margin performance in Q1. Uh, we did see product gross margins uh, decline slightly sequentially, 
though uh, remaining strong, while at the same time we are aggressively competing and winning uh, customers' secondary and lower storage tiers with our eFamily solutions and, and Flash Array C. Uh, but you know, the Flash pricing volatility, again, just highlights the differentiated advantages of our Purity software and direct Flash technology. And as a reminder, QLC Flash represents the majority of the Flash we consume today, uh, really providing a meaningful sustained cost advantage, both against TLC Flash and commercial SSDs using uh, QLC Flash. Thank you, Mita. Next question, please. Our next question comes from Howard Ma from Guggenheim Securities. Please go ahead, your line is open. Thanks, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for taking the question. I guess for, for Charlie or for Kevin, how would you guys characterize the, the demand environment relative to, to say, uh, I guess all of last, last fiscal year and then relative to a few months ago? Would, would you say that IT spending optimizations are largely behind us now? And, and you're starting to see material uptick in demand or, or not necessarily. And then just one, one quick follow-up on, on AI inferencing specifically or, or AI inferencing driven demand, are you starting to see enough of an uptick at least in, in pipeline? I know it's not in the numbers yet, but it's in pipeline to call out or is that still too early? Thank you. Howard, we're gonna, we're gonna take your first question because we're going one question of one part, but we'll get back to it if we can, if there's time, the second one. So um, I, I think that uh, you know, I've, I did state it in my prepared remarks is that it, certainly it's an improvement over last year, but I can't say we've seen a major inflection uh, yet. So, um, you know, it started to pick up around Q4. I can't say it's changed much since uh, Q4. I, I do think AI has caused customers to, to take a second look as to how they're going to be spending their money uh, this year. But overall, I'd say it's a uh, it's a it, it's a modest recovery from from last uh, from last year, but I haven't seen a, a big inflection point. Thank you, Howard. Next question, please. Comes from Pindulim Bora from JP Morgan. Please go ahead, your line is open. Hey guys, this is Noah on for Pendulum. Thanks for taking the question. You, you talked about a potential design win um, at a hyperscaler by a year end. Can you just help uh, us understand how those discussions have evolved so far? You mentioned in your prepared remarks that the quantity and quality of discussions with hyperscope have advanced considerably this past quarter. So any other call you can provide there would be helpful. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. what I um, you meant to convey with that remark is that uh, you, we are having conversations with multiple hyperscalers. When we talk about hyperscalers, um, and this maybe go back some quarters, uh, you know, we're really speaking about the top 10 hyperscalers. So it goes beyond just the, the three public uh, clouds, if you will, to the, um, uh, to the other, the fangs, et cetera. Uh, in this, so um, we uh, though the quantity, meaning the number of those uh, players that we speak to, and the quality of those conversations ha have improved. Uh, mentioned as well that we're now not just uh, experiencing testing in some of those environments, but some commercial discussions as well. So all those are, are positive signs, if you will, that that uh, lead us to believe that a design win this year. Thank you, Noah. Next question, please. Our next question comes from Wamsi Mohan from Bank of America. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Hi. Thank you so much for taking my question. This is Natty on for Wamsi. Um, I saw that in the quarter your headcount declined slightly. Um, could you explain on why that is the case, and is there any implications on um, how the sales capacity will be like moving forward? Yeah, well, we continue to invest in sales capacity, uh, you know, given the opportunities that we see in front of us. What I, what I would, the only thing I would say on, on the number, uh, you know, which does tend to fluctuate quarter to quarter, is we have been increasingly been focused on, on two things that work against a, a consistently higher number. And that is that we're working on overall quality of new customer ads. Uh, and secondly, on uh, putting more focus, if you will, than in the past on expansions in existing accounts. Uh, so I wouldn't read too much into it. Uh, I uh, do expect that with over 12.5, I'm not sure what the current count is, but somewhere between 12 and 13,000 customers now, we're in, this, in the back half, if you will, of customer acquisition. And so we should start to see a moderating, if you will, of those numbers. Yeah, just a, a quick follow on to that too. Look, the uh, customer acquisition count was consistent with what we saw uh, a year ago in, in Q1. And uh, we're also pleased, uh, to Charlie's point, on the quality of, of new customers acquired as we continue to increase our 
penetration of the uh, Fortune 500 customers. Thank you, Natty. Next question, please. Our next question comes from Mike Zikos from Needham. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Thanks for the, the time, guys. I just wanted to circle up on uh, one and flex growth uh, just to get a, a temperature, but how did adoption or growth of one and flex uh, in the quarter track versus your internal expectations? And then is there any way to think about um, customers which are adopting, whether it's uh, primarily coming from existing customers or, or new logo lands? Uh, anything there would be beneficial. Oh, Charlie, why don't you take adoption first yeah. and your view on adoption, and I'll, I'll hit the uh, comparability. Yeah, the Q1 adoption was perhaps a bit lower than we than we might have expected from a pure seasonality standpoint. But I would say that uh, you know typically, well, first of all, the um, Evergreen One, uh, interestingly, is adopted pretty much equally by both uh, uh, commercial, what we call commercial enterprises, mid market, as well as by large enterprises. And in the average quarter, certainly all through last year, we had a mixture of commercial and large deals uh, in each of the quarters, and that drove a lot of the number. This quarter was characterized by not having a particularly large deal in, in Evergreen One, and that compared with last year uh, as having quite a few in that quarter. So, uh, yeah, we think of it as, as being uh, just an aberration. We, you know, as, as we mentioned, we're still expecting $600 million, roughly speaking, for Evergreen One this year. Yeah, and I'll double click on that a little bit. And, and just in terms of utilization on, on Evergreen One, that continues to be very strong uh, in terms of deployment of our infrastructure, uh, really following a, a very strong year uh, last year. But as a reminder, you know, we began providing an annual view of uh, TCV sales uh, for our storage as a service offerings, really to help provide uh, insights to our annual revenue growth expectations. Uh, and providing uh, you know quarterly updates to monitor progress against our annual uh, expectations against the 600 million in TCV sales that uh, Charlie alluded to. Uh, in Q1, our TCV sales uh, for storage as a service offerings were 56 million, you know, which is a bit of a slower start uh, to the year than we would have liked. However, you know, as we progress throughout uh, Q1, we saw strong demand and pipeline build including large opportunities uh, for storage as a service offerings. And consistent with our original FY25 forecast, we continue to expect 50% growth uh, of our storage as a service offerings, and we'll continue to provide uh, quarterly updates as we progress through the year. Thank you, Mike. Terrific. Next question, please. Thank you. Our next question, question comes from Avia Merchant from Citigroup. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Great. Thank you for taking my question. Um, Great results. Uh, if I may, at the last quarter, I think you provided, when you, when you guys talked about the fiscal 25 guide, I think you provided some, um, how to think about the product versus subscription services. If you can kind of double down on that, how we should think about product revenues. They were a little bit stronger than what I was modeling versus subscription that came in maybe slightly lower. So maybe if you can just, you know, help us understand how we should think about the trajectory of those two, that would be great. Thanks. Sure. Well, if you think about a transaction, uh, you know, any individual transaction, it will be, it'll be generally one or the other. Um, in the case of a, of a CapEx transaction, there is a, um, there's a subscription component to it, but it's much smaller. And in the case of an Evergreen One transaction, there'll be no immediate revenue associated with it, uh, but of course, a higher, a higher amount of subscription, uh, you know, on an on a annual, uh, annual basis. And so, the, you know, for, from our standpoint, we want to provide the customer uh, whichever part, whichever one of those services that they prefer. Uh, you know, while we have some um, incentives in for the sales force to sell the subscription, uh, we certainly don't want to lose a deal for a customer with a customer that wants to buy on a capex basis. And so, you know, all else being equal, if we see, uh, assuming we're winning at the same rate. If we see slower uptake on the subscription, we'll see we uh, we'll still win the deal on capex. We'll see a somewhat overachievement on the on the uh, revenue line uh, in the immediate uh, in the immediate term. Whereas if we see a greater uptake on Evergreen One, we'll see a slow a lower um, it, uh, effect on revenue in the immediate term. So that's the right way to think about it. Uh, we've given a number out before; it's a rough number, but about 70% of the value of a capex deal uh, of a sorry, of a subscription deal would go to CapEx if it were or a CapEx deal. 
Yeah, I think just taking a step back from from what we uh, discussed last quarter uh, to kick off the fiscal year, you know, I think it, it is better to look at this from a total revenue standpoint in terms of the bridging and, and that bridging, uh, assuming we achieve the expectations of 600 million in TCV sales for our subscription as a service, uh, would be, you know, would put uh, the total revenue around mid-teens growth. And, and that thesis has not changed. I think when you start uh, looking specifically at product revenue, uh, I would tell you that we were quite pleased with what we saw uh, in Q1 uh, from a product revenue growth rate uh, perspective. Thank you, Asia. Next question, please. Our next question comes from Nehal Chokshi from Northland Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Uh, yeah, thank you. And uh, strong results here. Congratulations. Um, I'm not sure if you covered this, but given the strong results, um, above guidance results, uh, why are you not changing your fiscal year guidance parameters both on the top and bottom line? Yeah, th- thanks for the question. And, and yeah, you know, we, we are definitely pleased with the strong start to the year, uh, as you point out, both with uh, top line and operating profit outperforming. Uh, but overall, at this stage, we believe reiterating our annual guide uh, is appropriate. You know, when you think about it from a revenue lens, uh, Q1 performance uh, provides us with increasing confidence uh, for the remainder of the year. Uh, but considerations also include that Q1 is, is generally our seasonally slowest quarter in the year. And also, as we previously discussed, uh, TCV sales expectations for our storage as a service offerings also have an impact on our annual revenue guide expectations. And we'll want to see how that uh, plays out uh, as well. When we think about it from an operating profit uh, lens, you know, the, the strength was driven by a few key factors, including revenue uh, outperformance, gross margin strength. And while our hiring is strong, we're also seeing some financial benefit as a result of some workforce alignment adjustments during Q4 uh, of last year. Uh, While reiterating our annual operating margin guide, we're also planning to increase investments in some key areas in engineering and go to market uh, specific to AI and the opportunity we see specific with hyperscalers, uh, providing our purity and direct flash technology for both their high performance and bulk storage uh, environments. Thank you, Nahal. Next question, please. Our next question comes from Simon Leopold from Raymond James. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Thanks for taking the question. I I don't want to ask such a backwards-looking question, but uh, essentially the 10% customer disclosure for the prior fiscal year makes me wonder, what's what's your customer concentration like now, and and how do you think about how that concentration um, might evolve uh, over the next year or so. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, we did disclose uh, in, in our 10K uh, what that we filed last year that we had a 10% customer mix in terms of concentration remains relatively consistent, and we did not have a, a 10% uh, customer in terms of revenue concentration this quarter. Thank and your you, outlook? Uh, we, we don't provide outlook on, on concentration. Thank you, Simon. Next question, please. Our next question comes from David Vogt from UBS. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Great. Thank you, guys. And this is for both Kevin and uh, Giancarlo. Maybe can you guys talk about the TCV sort of trajectory that you expect this year? Obviously, you disclosed, you know, a number of 56 million in your prepared remarks. Um, And just trying to think about how the the timing of this sort of ratable or the subscription business starts to flow into the business as we move through the rest of this fiscal year. And is there the expectation that there is sort of an acceleration um, of demand as maybe the storage market gets a bit healthier as we move into the latter half of calendar 24 into early 25. Thanks. Yeah. Well, I want to separate out, uh, you know, the uh, because I, uh, your question was a bit ambiguous. You know, in terms of uh, the 56 million related to uh, TCV, new TCV, uh, and as we go through the year, uh, you know, we are expecting 600, or at least we're forecasting 600 for the full year, and we're sticking to that. We think it'll pick up. We think there's really more timing issue associated with Q1. But, uh, you know, on an overall um, uh, actual uh, revenue uh, component for the year now, we we have total subscriptions, which include Evergreen uh, One, Evergreen Forever, uh, Evergreen Flex, as well as our Portworks uh, uh, products and, and Cloud Block Store. You know, that is approaching 50%. It's in the 40s. Uh, current, we expect in the 40s this year. 
that's that's approaching 50 percent. Uh, and, uh, you know, as we go into next year and beyond, uh, we we do ex expect to see it increase above 50 uh, percent as a whole. So, uh, you know, of course, uh, we're a seasonal business as we go through the year. We're expecting sales of both product and uh, uh, and services to increase through the year. But as I said, uh, we expect the proportion of the uh, subscription revenue uh, to uh, continue to increase. And then, Great, and then when we're problem. thinking, yeah, just a quick clarification, when we're thinking about uh, TCV sales for storage as a service offerings, we've talked about uh, contract duration associated uh, with those TCV sales, and, and we haven't had any meaningful change uh, around three years is, is what we've disclosed. Perfect. That Thank you, be my David. Follow -up. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you, David. Next question, please. Our next question comes from Aaron Rakers from Wells Fargo. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Yeah, thanks for uh, taking the question. I apologize if I missed this earlier. I'm uh, juggling a few things here tonight. I'm curious about the, the AI discussion. There seems to be just like this inflection around, you know, AI infrastructure, uh, maybe vectoring for AI training, driving a, a lot of demand for increased capacity points uh, for FSDs and, and just flash storage. I'm curious if, can you give us any kind of updated thoughts on the roadmap of, of your DFM and whether or not you're starting to see some kind of an acceleration or inflection of just demand pull for these higher and higher capacity points? You bet. Let me start. Uh, talk about the demand for, um, you know, AI uh, uh, for training environments. You know, as we look at training environments, and, and I think we now have a pretty good and broad understanding of what the average, if you will, training environment looks like. And what we see is that the uh, uh, the dollar attach to an AI training environment after you've paid for um, you know the GPUs and the networking and the racks and so forth it is in the five to ten percent range. So perhaps a bit less than uh, than the market might be anticipating, but we're fairly confident that the uh, total storage attached, at least in the near term. For AI training is in that five to ten percent range. Part of the reason for that, by the way, is just the expense right now of the GPUs uh, themselves. Um, so that sort of puts it um, in perspective overall. That being said, uh, you know we think that uh, probably in the past uh, 12 months, about a billion dollars was spent on um, uh, on storage specifically tied to AI uh, training environments. Again, that might be a bit less than people expect, but. I think our data on that is is uh, is very very good, um, so that gives you a sense of current order of magnitude. Uh, that, I'm going to pass and, it to and, Rob. And, 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 and then, yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass it to Rob on, you know, uh, the current status of our technology. Yeah, Aaron, uh, this is Rob, and and I think the uh, specific to the first part of your question, uh, asking about, hey, so what are the uh, training environments, these large scale build outs? Uh, what are we seeing in terms of the demand environment for uh, SSDs and and in particular, the larger capacity SSDs. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, most of these high performance training environments, uh, whether they're provided by us uh, or uh, uh, built uh, by, you know, uh, other, uh, either the customer or other vendors uh, are generally rely, uh, uh, residing on SSDs. Uh, we are seeing, um, you know, some of the larger SSDs, uh, larger capacity SSDs being deployed uh, in some of these very specific environments. Uh, you know, specifically because of the uh, efficiencies uh, and, and power limitations uh, that exist in these environments, right? The, you know, the amount of GPUs that are being built out, uh, frankly, are sucking up all the power out there. Uh, you know, most of these uh, customers uh, are uh, struggling uh, to uh, power these build outs. And the efficiencies that the larger capacity uh, drives uh, enable uh, is something that, well, I think it's a great validation point for uh, our long-term strategy. Now, uh, the flip side of this, the flip side of this is that um, you know what allows us to provide these large SSDs uh, with uh, all of the commensurate benefits in terms of uh, performance, power savings, and efficiency is our direct to flash, uh, direct flash uh, software. Uh, without that direct flash software, uh, the large capacity commodity SSDs uh, simply can't provide these benefits. Um, you know, and uh, you know, and so as a result, they're inherently less efficient. Uh, they come with significant trade-offs. And uh, they're very, very difficult to use, uh, which is why uh, you know we see them uh, only being deployed in very specific uh, environments. Aaron, if you'd like to do thank a follow-up, we'd love to have you get back in queue. I think we might be able to get to it today. So thank you. Next question, please. Our next question comes from Mehdi Hosini from Susquehanna International Group. Please go ahead. Your line is open. 
Yes, uh, thanks for taking the question. Given your Q1 performance, uh, especially with revenue mix and your fiscal year, it seems to me that product revenue should be flat for fiscal year 25 and the growth primarily driven by uh, services revenue. And given the uh, higher gross margin associated with services, that should help with some uh, gross margin expansion. Is that the right uh, frame of mind for the fiscal year? Yeah, I think directionally you're thinking about that, right? Thank you, Maddie. Next question, please. Our next question comes from Eric Martinuzzi from Lake Street. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Yeah, took note of the uh, incremental increase there in your Fortune 500 customers, uh, four new Fortune 500 customers. So uh, curious to know, across your larger new customer uh, growth, are you seeing any commonality in the, the use cases for for why these new customers are showing up at your door? Yeah, uh, honestly, it's the fact that we are able to provide them a solution that is, uh, first of all, more consistent across the wide variety of use cases that they have, block, file, and object, uh, that's managed by uh, you know a common operating environment and a co- and the same uh, and a single management uh, system, and, and we're able to do so. Uh, with a product that's simpler, more reliable, uh, and uh, takes less space, power, and cooling. Um, So, you know, you add those things together, it's a a pretty good uh, value proposition that's hard to beat. But there wasn't anything like, you know, AI training environment was the thing that opened the door or something like that? I'd say there are multiple entrances. uh, And, uh, yeah, sometimes it might be the AI environment that gets the customer to to be interested, uh, but... You know, honestly, it it really is the uh, the new positioning of the company of being able to satisfy a, a broad range, which helps in the AI environment because, um, you know, one way of building your um, your storage environment for AI is to make a copy of all the data you think you might want to use and put it onto a brand new array. Uh, that that array is connected to your AI environment. Uh, what we're proposing is don't bother doing that. Um, uh, upgrade the arrays that you have in place and and make them available uh, and accessible to your AI application inference environment. Um, it's a it's a uh, it, it's a strategy that costs less. Uh, it's a strategy that uh, enables uh, more access to real time data, uh, and it's a strategy that at the same time simplifies their their environment. So um, you know again, I think it's the the total value proposition. Uh, and you're you're right, the entrance. In might be opened up by a, you know a different door or window in in the customer's environment, but I, I would say there's no no big theme out of this. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Next question, please. Our next question comes from Krish Sankar from TD Cowan. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Cowan, your line is open. Okay, let's go to the next question. Certainly. Our next question comes from Tim Long from Barclays. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Thank you. Um, Just a question on the, if I could if we're going to talk about kind of the AI and hyperscaler opportunities, Charlie, I understand you'd look at them a little bit differently, but, you know, thinking back to the rev recognition you guys had with Meta, it seems like, you know, each one had a little bit different uh, margin profile in it. So just curious, when you start looking at these new opportunities, particularly in the hyperscaler side, replacing disk, um, do you have any sense what the model, uh, financial model for Pure will look like there? I imagine it's going to be a much different dynamic than just, you know, send, selling, uh, uh, you know, arrays into enterprises. So I, I know it is early days, but anything high level you can talk about um, how, you know, dealing with these much larger customers with kind of different business model than what you're currently seeing, how would that uh, play into the, the current uh, framework of Pure? Thank you. Yep. Yeah, uh, thanks. So uh, I'm going to take two separately, AI and then hyperscaler. So in the case of AI, we, we've now largely um, you know, made uh, changes internally to the company where that'll flow pretty much at the normal uh, gross margins 
of the company. Um, you know, they may be a you know um, a bit lower, but overall not going to affect the margins of the company uh, as a whole. Uh, I would say that on the hyperscaler front, we're still evaluating you know different ways of working with these hyperscalers, and they won't be the same. Uh, they'll be different, and until we actually get to the uh, to the point where where we understand uh, you know exactly how they want to buy and how we can provide, uh, you know, uh, we can't really say right now. But once we do, we'll certainly have a model that we that we provide you all uh, with uh, at the earliest possible date. Thank you, Tim. Uh, it looks like there's one more question. Um, Asia, thank you very much for getting back in queue. This is your follow-up question. Our next question comes from Asia Merchant from Citigroup. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Okay, great. Thank you again. Uh, apologize if this has been asked, but the upside in the growth margin, you know, on both, if you can just unpack that and, you know, how we should think about it, in the outer quarters, clearly one Q is soft and you're expecting revenues to increase from here on, you know, just seasonally as well. How we should think about product gross margins as well as subscription gross margins in the outer quarters. Thank you. Yeah, this is Kevin. You know, when we think about the strength that we're seeing on, on gross margins, both product and subscription, I would say that uh, we, we wouldn't be expecting any meaningful changes as we uh, progress through the year. Um, you know, I, I do think that uh, you know, we've commented on uh, being aggressive in pricing uh, with our uh, price performance um, solutions, whether that's our, our E family or Flasher AC, and we'll continue uh, to do that. Uh, but overall, we would not expect uh, significant or meaningful uh, changes one way or the other. Thank you, Asya. Before we conclude, I think Charlie has some concluding remarks. Yeah, thank you all for joining us again today on today's earnings call. Um, I think, as we've uh, discussed, our platform strategy continues to lead the industry's transformation. And by enabling businesses to embrace uh, uh, this change with AI, with a unified, a versatile, energy-efficient platform that really allows them to uh, look at their uh, data centers and cloud environments as a single uh, cloud of storage. I do look forward to meeting uh, with you all, with our customers and partners and investors at our annual Accelerate Conference in Las Vegas next month. And uh, we're going to be also on some road shows uh, throughout, uh, throughout the globe where you'll be able to learn more about the investments that we're making to continue to lead uh, innovation in the industry and uh, hear more about the Pure Storage platform. So hope to see you all next month. Thank you so much for joining and uh, talk to you later. That concludes the Pure Storage First Quarter Fiscal 2025 Financial Results Conference Call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect your lines.